1492, October the 12th, after a month on the open sea, Christopher Columbus landed on one of the Bahama Islands near Cuba, and he named it San Salvador. Now at the very same time, back in Europe, there was a German author, and he wrote a book called the Nuremberg Chronicle. And this book listed and described all the calamities, all the tragedies and the disasters that had happened to the human race all the way up to that time, and left the last few books, the pages of the book, left them blank so that the writers could still write in the calamities that were yet to come. I mean, the whole tone of the book was just this feeling of dejection and fear. Now, now, isn't it amazing? This is happening at the same time. And so on the one hand, you've got this fear and this despair. And on the other hand, Christopher Columbus, he sails into the harbor in Lisbon with this amazing tale of going to the far parts of the earth and discovering a whole new world, a whole new world of possibilities. We need to have the outlook of Christopher Columbus when we talk about the last day, when we talk about how this world will end and when time runs out. Today, as we look at what the Bible has to say about the last day when the world ends, we're going to do it in a way that's not fearful, not despairing. The right way for us as Christians to face the last day is with hope, with anticipation, excitement, even great joy, because on that day, all of Jesus' promises to you, they're finally going to be made complete, and you'll get to experience a new world, heaven, to come forever. Now, as we focus on the end of the world, we don't find just one Bible passage that describes all the events that will happen on the last day. In fact, throughout the Bible, the last day is written about in many, many places. And so we're going to look at a few scripture passages, and they're very clear. You'll find them on your insert of sermon notes that's in your bulletin. So if you haven't already, take it out. Grab a pen or a pencil. You fill in some of the words and jot any notes down there if you wish. And we're going to look at three events. Of the last day. We're going to look at the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the reckoning or judgment, the reckoning of all. So the return of Christ. It's in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the story in Acts begins right after Easter Sunday and Jesus rose again from the dead. After Easter, Jesus with, was with his disciples about six weeks, about 40 days, and he made many appearances to them. And then on one day, Jesus leads his group of disciples outside of Jerusalem, and as he's blessing them, he's bodily taken up before their very eyes and ascends up into heaven until a cloud hides him from their sight. And the disciples are standing down below, and they're just kind of gazing up there, kind of craning their necks, still looking and looking. And two angels come and go, uh, guys, uh, hey guys, guys, what are you doing? And the angel said, don't just stand here staring up at the clouds. He gave this promise. This same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And here the angel, in real, simple, clear words, states the fact. Jesus will return. He's going to return from the sky. He's going to return in a way that everyone will see him. But most importantly, he'll return. That's a fact. Now the way, the manner he comes back, Jesus himself said, and Matthew recorded it, says, they, that's all people, they, will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So the first time that Jesus came, he came quietly, humbly.
humbly, born by Mary, laid in the manger in Bethlehem. He uh, lived a quiet, humble life. He wasn't a prince, wasn't a ruler, hardly anybody took notice of him. And although he was God, he didn't look like God, and he allowed himself to even go to the cross to be killed as a, a poor criminal and to suffer and die there on the cross to pay for all of your sins with his death. But when Christ comes again, he will not come humbly as before. He will return with power and great glory. And this is the almighty power and glory that Jesus has had from time began and before. His power and glory as true God. And this time his appearance will not go unnoticed. It will be an overwhelming display of Jesus' majesty. It will be so overwhelming that many people, especially unbelievers, are going to just melt in fear. You know, it's been said that when Jesus comes again on Judgment Day, there'll be no atheists. And that's true. Because what it means is that all people are going to see Jesus coming again as God, and they will have to say, oh wow, he's God. Right? No atheists in that way. An overpowering sight. Now, when will this happen? Well, we don't no, exactly, because Jesus himself said this, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. But because we don't know the time of the return of Jesus, what that means for us is that it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be decades or generations to come, and so we should always be ready, always. Many years ago, John D. Rockefeller, he was a guy who lived the American dream. He was a millionaire at a time when a million dollars was huge. Millionaire by the age of 23. By the age of 50, he was the richest man on earth. He could buy almost anything on earth that he desired. But at the age of 53, he was diagnosed with a serious illness. He lost his hair, his eyebrows, his eyelashes. He couldn't eat much, only milk and crackers. That's all he could digest. Became sunken and couldn't sleep, didn't smile. Nothing in life, and he owned a lot. Nothing meant anything to him. And the doctors told him, you'll be dead within a year. But one night, when it was difficult to sleep, he realized that should he die, he can't take all of this immense wealth with him. And so the next day, he began a new way of living. Rather than keep and hoard all of his wealth for himself, he decided to give to those who were in need. He started the Rockefeller Foundation, and poured money into hospitals, into research, into mission work. His money is directly responsible for the discovery of penicillin, for the cures for malaria, tuberculosis, and diphtheria. He began living to give, not giving. And he didn't die in one year at age 54. He lived to be 98. See, see, our days on earth, they're limited. Jesus is going to return. And we need to have a perspective that we live each day knowing he will return. And so we live to serve God and serve others, love God, love others. And our giving isn't motivated by a fear that we're going to die and be dead. Our giving is motivated by Jesus who gave everything.
for you and me. He suffered the pains of the cross. He even suffered hell for us. And Jesus has blessed you with forgiveness, given you hope and joy and peace, even heaven to come. And since Jesus has given so much to you, give to him, serve him, live to do something that really matters to advance his kingdom so people know him and spend eternity with him. After all, Jesus will return. And when this world is all over and done, what's really important? What will really last? It's not our wealth. Jesus will return. So be ready. Now, when Jesus returns, there'll be a resurrection of all the dead. Paul said, this is a matter of fact, he used these words, there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So he's telling us all the dead will come back to life, not just some, all people who ever lived. Now many people criticize this belief as being absolutely preposterous. I mean, how can bodies that have decomposed all the way into dust be brought back to life? How can bodies that were buried at sea or eaten by wild animals or cremated and had their ashes sprinkled in the wind. How can those bodies be brought back together and be given life again? And the Bible teaches that the body you now have will be raised again. And you know, when we believe in a God who by his power and his love can create all of this world in an instant, and believing that he can pull our bodies back together and raise us back to life, that's not so hard. Now, will your resurrected body be different? Will, what will your body be like? It's been fun in um, the uh, Tuesday morning of Season Saints class, and Bill, you're part of that. We were going through the book of Revelation, and one little old woman, um, uh, Margaret Urich, who is in her 90s, she said, well, when I come back, she said, I want to be a blonde 22 and taller than five foot seven. I'm putting my order in. So that's what she wants to be. But what will our bodies really be like? Well, the best that we know is the Bible says we will be perfect, perfect. Not subject to sin or sickness, or any weakness anymore it will be perfect in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 Paul says listen I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet where the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed he said the dead will be raised imperishable not perishing in other words never to die again they'll be perfect but what about people who are still living when that happens they have to die first and then be raised back to life he says no we'll not all sleep in other words not everybody will be dead at that time when the end comes but those will be changed so just as the dead will be raised and made perfect there's a need for people still living to be made perfect and they'll be changed on the last day all the dead will be resurrected those still living will be changed and then all will be gathered together for the reckoning or the judgment of all you know these days if we go in any courtroom before the court session starts a bailiff will announce to everybody gathered all rise and everybody stands as the judge enters, goes to the front, and takes the seat first on the bench. Sign of respect. Now picture, if you can, how this judgment will go when Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in all of his glory and all of the angels with him, he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. 
Can you imagine what that sight would be like? You know, when Jesus came the first time, he came in mercy, he came as your savior. When he returns as judge, this time he'll bring all of his angels, sit on his heavenly throne in all of that glory, and the whole universe of angels and people will be gathered before him. This judgment is real public because all ears of all time are going to hear what he says. Hear him praise those who are his, who trust in him, and hear him condemn those who have rejected him and are going to hell. But when you're standing there, when that day comes and you're standing there, and you see Jesus on his heavenly throne, I want to encourage you. Don't look at all the glory. Don't look at all of the angels. Look for his hands. Look at his hands. And there in the hands, you'll see the marks of nails. See the marks of the one who went to the cross for you. See, this judge is the same one who loves you so much that he was willing to give his life for you on the cross. Wow. What a wonderful judge. He loves you that deeply. Now, how will he judge? What's the standard of his judgment? Well, a lot of people don't understand that because a lot of people say, you know, I'm a pretty good person, so if God is fair, he wouldn't keep people out of heaven, so I stand a pretty good chance of getting into heaven. But you see, if you appeal to God's justice and fairness, if you appeal to how you've lived, kind of your record of right and wrongs, well, you'll be lost. Psalm 130 says in the Bible, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Because no one deserves heaven. All of us, we're all sinful. All of us deserve only eternal hell. But, see the standard, of, the standard of how God judges is not looking at what you've done. And he doesn't want you to look at what you've done. He looks at who you trust. Who you trust. Jesus judges your heart. It's whether you believe, whether you trust in him as your savior. That's what Jesus looks for. It's whether on that last day you say, Lord, please don't look at what I've done because I've made a mess of my life and I failed you. And yet, Jesus, you died and paid for my sins. And because of what you've done, you've promised me forgiveness in heaven. And I trust you. I trust your promise. See, Jesus said, the very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. It's his word, his promise. It's whether you believe his promise or whether you say, nah, I don't want it or I, I don't believe it's true. That's what gives you his love and his forgiveness. It's that faith. And so your eternal destiny depends on whether you have faith his gracious promises to you. His promise of forgiveness. His word is true. There was a young widow one day who moved to a small town. You know, small towns can be known for a lot of gossip. And this young widow had three young children, and she was very pretty, but the town noticed that some things were going on that didn't look so good. There were men coming and going from her house. Her kids were often running the streets without any supervision, didn't have anything to eat, so they were eating over at neighbors' houses. And she seemed to be just laying on the couch all the time, reading. Well, one day, she was in town at the post office, and she collapsed. And that was when the truth came tumbling out. She had an incurable disease. She couldn't do her housework. And she sent the children out when the drugs couldn't stop the intense pain. 
She didn't want them there to see all of that. The men who were coming and going, one was her deceased husband's brother, one was a family lawyer, and the other was a doctor. See, the, the town then, once they understood that they had been so wrong, they had so misjudged her, then they were kind to her the remaining months of her life, but they had so badly misjudged her. And you know, our judgments of others are often wrong. We're often way off base. And even our judgments of ourselves are often wrong. Only Jesus knows our hearts. Only Jesus judges true. And on that basis, according to your heart, then he'll pass sentence. On the last day, he'll pass sentence. And he said, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Gathered before his judgment throne, Jesus will pass sentence on all people. Those who believe and trust in him as their savior, they are the ones blessed by my father. They inherit the glory of the heavenly kingdom forever. But those who reject Jesus, who don't want him, those are cursed, sent to the eternal torment of in fire that's prepared for not people, but prepared for the devil and his demons. So you see, friends, you've got a choice, a choice about how you will face that last day. You can face that day in fear, or you can face that day with excitement, anticipation, with great joy, because what happens on that day is determined now. It's determined now. Now, Jesus offers you his forgiveness. Now, he gives it to you. It's his free gift. You and I don't deserve it, but he died and paid for it. Paid completely. Paid for all of your mistakes and faults and sins. And he offers you pardon and peace and heaven for free. And so now is the time to believe and to trust him as Savior. So friends, take him up on his promises. And even though they're so wonderful, they may seem hard to believe, take him up. Because as you rely on him as your Savior, then on that day, you'll have nothing to fear. Jesus, the judge, will say to you, come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we go to our God in our prayers today. And in our prayers,